In this module, we're going to discuss phonemic awareness as part of reading development. In 2000, the National Reading Panel came out with wonderful research, a study uh, based on the best practices in reading instruction. It focused on five areas, the first of which is phonemic awareness. Now, remember, research and evidence-based practice is not one size fits all. Uh, for as wonderful as the work uh, of the National Reading Panel is, I do just want to make sure we're all aware that, that this research was not done on students who are English language learners. So it's very important that if you have students in your class or on your caseload that are culture, from culturally and linguistically diverse homes who are English language learners, be sure to supplement what we talk about with evidence-based practice for those specific populations. So phonemic awareness. I think it's important to start by having a, a larger understanding of phonemic awareness within the larger umbrella of phonological awareness. So phonological awareness is the ability to recognize that words are made up of a, a variety of sound units. It encompasses a number of sound related skills necessary for a person to develop as a reader. Now, you need to understand that words are made up of these small sound units that we refer to as phonemes and that words can be segmented into larger sound chunks known as syllables. Each syllable begins with a sound, the onset, and ends with another sound, the rhyme. So phonological awareness provides the basis for phonics. So, so what is a phoneme? A phoneme is the smallest unit of sound in a language that holds meaning. So if this refers to only one aspect of sound, the phoneme, when we're talking about phonemic awareness. The ability to hear and then manipulate the different sounds in a language. So phonological awareness, as I mentioned, is, is the umbrella and phonemic awareness is one component of that within that umbrella. Phonemic awareness is a, a sub-skill, if you will. Phonemic awareness is so important to our work and our practice because it's the foundation for spelling and word recognition skills. One of the best predictors of how well a child will learn to read is phonemic awareness. And so it's so important that we fold phonemic awareness activities into each experience that we have with one of our students. Now, when a student's first language does not include the phonemes in English, it's especially important that we have an awareness to this and then tailor our practice as necessary so that if the student is not accustomed to hearing those specific sounds and phonemes, it can be quite difficult to distinguish and differentiate between those sounds. So even pronouncing the new sounds can be difficult. So it's important that, that in general, we have this awareness so that we can differentiate between what is a need in building the student's understanding and abilities in phonemic awareness versus um, perhaps it not having to do with their phonemic awareness but not differentiating those sounds and, and understanding that those two things are different. So when a student can't perceive and work with the, the phonemes of spoken word, then it will be difficult relating these phonemes to letters when they see them in written words. So this is the connection between the phonemic awareness, which is all done auditorily, and later reading. Not to say that it's not wonderful practice to, to bring the grapheme in as appropriate, but true phonemic awareness activities are done without uh, the, the print in front of them. I think it's a great scaffold as we get to older students where the letters are age appropriate, who perhaps needs support that maybe would have happened at a younger age. But when you're doing this work with our very youngest students, um, you don't necessarily need to have the grapheme. So one thing that we can do is, for our students who don't necessarily differentiate between those sounds just yet, is model the production of the sound and demonstrate and reinforce the production of the sound. 
We can help beginning readers learn to identify the sounds in short words, so we don't need to start with multisyllabic words, but short consonant vowel consonant words to help them hear the sound at the beginning, the end, and then the middle of the word. So as I mentioned, use consonant vowel consonant words, identify the sounds at the beginning, the middle, and the end, and have students even sort pictures with the same sounds at the beginning and the middle or the end. So you can even take the, the auditory demands out for a visual learner and, and show them pictures. Now again, it's very crucial, especially for those students who are English language learners, to make sure that they know that the, the pictures that you're presenting to them are in their lexicon. Um, so it's, it's not going to accurately measure their ability to hear the same sound if they're not familiar with those words. So that's something that you may need to teach to or really plan your lesson around ensuring that the pictures represent vocabulary that is known to those students. Another strategy um, to bring in a kinesthetic component uh, is a program called Sounds in Motion. Now remember we talked about evidence-based practice earlier and so I do just want to mention that it's important to review the research behind any program and supplement it with additional evidence-based practice for the populations that uh, you're going to be using the, the program with. But one of the things that I do really like about this program is that it uses gross motor body movements that have the same characteristics as the sound that we're asking the student to produce and perceive. So pitch, duration, tension, and intensity. So for example, when we want a student to hear and produce the n sound for n, sounds in motion will have us do a gross motor body movement and bring n our hand up almost simulating what our tongue is doing to the roof of our mouth. Now our students don't need to know that, but how amazing the brain is to have us do the gross body movement, gross motor body movement, and help us produce that sound. And it's amazing how students now are able to attach that motor movement with the sound. My recommendation at this point when using that program would be to bring in the grapheme as we know how important it is to then pair the sound symbol correspondence. Um, before we move on, I also just want to share that, that that sounds in motion is very helpful with the vowel sounds in particular. So we've talked about um, how our students who are English language learners may not differentiate and discriminate the sounds um, as easily as if those sounds had been in their L1. But I have found across students who are culturally and linguistically diverse and my English only students that the vowel sounds are tricky to hear but when I pair that with a gross motor body movement it's all of a sudden much easier to hear the difference between an eh and an i. Eh. They feel the tension and so you can walk into a class whether it's a student with or without an IEP and hear them trying to sound out a word and then all of a sudden adding the body movement and, and realizing and getting the encoding correct. So. Pretty neat and highly recommend that you, you think of ways to incorporate the child's need for movement into your instruction. So moving on, a statistically significant difference in phonological awareness and the rate of literacy emergence exists even when comparing a group who received just five minutes of phonological awareness a day and those who did not. I find this research to be incredibly exciting because one thing that every educator, therapist knows is we don't have a lot of time. We already often feel like we are at a loss for how much we need to accomplish not only in a given day but certainly across uh, a given school year. And so for me to read this research and realize that even if I can incorporate a phonological awareness activity into how I have my students line up at the end of class before we transition to lunch or at the end of a therapy session before I bring them back to class, that that five minutes will give them a great benefit as they become readers. And these activities can be fun and simultaneously be behavior management. So perhaps you have everyone seated at the rug after your lesson and you may want to ask everyone whose name starts with the sound Mmm, to line up. 
followed by everyone whose name starts with a t to line up. And there, they're listening, they're expanding their phonemic awareness, and they're simultaneously getting exactly where you need them to be. Some additional activities for phonemic awareness are simple things that you've likely done with your students already, and so I just want to make sure we're all aware of the wonderful benefit to some of these activities. So we all know we need to build breaks into our classroom for students and sometimes they just need to feel like they're not on task but guess what they don't need to know that actually that time is still going to be productive for their learning so for example sing a song how about bingo every time we clap we're actually building their understanding of the the units that make up that word or a silly sound substitution game I have a, a gorilla puppet that I like to use in my classroom and go around and start the rhyme but pause so that the students can fill in the rhyme for you. But use their peers and their friends' names. Names that they'll anticipate because maybe you're even going to hover the puppet over their head. Giggly goggly Gumberto, a gorilla sat on, and I hover over the student named Umberto. Also, a great classic. Old MacDonald, so we can take E-I-E-I-O and a song that's familiar and turn it into a learning game. So perhaps instead of a farmer who had certain animals, we switch it to a, a man or a woman who had a store. And in that store he had a name any object. Have the students generate the names and then have them tell you that the sound begins with and do a repeat. What's great is these activities can be translated and, and done in any language. Uh, another fun one, as your students build up their phonemic awareness skill, so we want to take it to the next level, is to think about how we can have a student manipulate the word. So for example, the word is rat. I want you to take away the er and add a s. What's the word now? and really get your students to play around with words and those phonemes and start to build up those skills that will let them soar as readers. What I really do find effective, this game for a student who doesn't necessarily have any learning challenges can be done purely auditorily. But for many of my students, I find it very effective to take some colored blocks for each of those sounds to really show the visual of I'm taking away this first red block, for example, and replacing it with a blue one so that they understand that that first sound is changing, but the rest is remaining the same. Again, I highly encourage you to get to know all of your students and their language backgrounds, and these activities can be done in all languages, so it doesn't need to only be done in English. And, and please know that there's such great benefit, and the research shows us the more we tap into our students' first language, their L1, that transfer into L2 is profound. And so let's take their strengths and bring it over rather than trying to have them start an uphill battle, relearning to read uh, without making those connections for them for, for what they may already know in L1. Just a few more activities. We talked about how behavior management can simultaneously be folded into your five minutes a day of phonemic awareness. If your name starts with a certain letter, line up now is always great. If you have three beats in your name, line up now. Or even to do a consistent activity each week, but perhaps changing out the focus sound. So a word hunt. We could then transfer this activity when they come in very active to the classroom after lunch and search for words with a certain letter and then turn it into a shared reading activity and bring everyone to the rug. So there's lots of ways to meet the needs of our students' activity levels, learning needs, IEP goals, and fold it all into a very comprehensive and effective research-based lesson. So here's an example of how we turn our word hunt every week into a shared reading experience. 
With my kindergartners, we followed this same formula for a few weeks at a time, so these became sight words that they know. We went on a hunt, we found some, and then we inserted the sound of the day or the sound of the week. Depending on the pace of, of your students, you can certainly um, go at a different pace. Uh, and then we would insert those pictures. Sometimes, depending on the students, I may hide those pictures around the room. Depending on the age, you may use realia, and they would actually find the objects in the room. Now, I don't imagine that, hopefully, they're not finding bugs or, or beds in your classroom, perhaps a cot, but um, you can find different ways to, to engage your students on this hunt, but bringing them back together and they join you in this reading activity with the visual support and with words that have become known sight words as you repeat the structure of the activity each week. I hope you'll try some of these activities with your students and lay a strong foundation of phonemic awareness to help them on their journey to launch as successful readers.